Um, okay, wonderful. It looks like we still have some folks joining us slowly, but uh, let's jump in. Um, uh, for Management Canada, Mathieu, did you have anything you wanted to say before I, I take over? No, that's great. Thank you. Wow. Thanks to everybody for, for coming this morning. Uh, I'm just going to say a quick welcome uh, this morning, this afternoon, uh, where I am anyway. So this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to uh, Non-Family Transition 101 with uh, Darcy Smith and Dana Penrice. Uh, we're happy to have them today. Um, they, Darcy and Dana will be uh, answering some questions at the end of the presentation. But uh, if you want to ask questions during the during the uh, the presentation, feel free to do so. Just use the Q and A function uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and other than that, I will let you guys uh, uh, begin on your merry way. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Mathieu, and uh, really appreciative uh, to be included in this Farm Transition Appreciation Day with Farm Management Canada. Um, if you do have questions that come up throughout, and we can get them to them in the moment. We'll also try to do that. Uh, so I'm Darcy Smith. I'm the uh, program manager for the BC land matching program delivered by Young Agrarians, um, where our team of land matchers connects farmers seeking land with landholders uh, and facilitates land sharing agreements. Um, and I wanted to just start today with a territory acknowledgement. So I live and work in the ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil peoples on the West Coast. Um, and uh, Young Agrarians recognizes the unresolved Indigenous land titles and rights in the diverse territories in what is today called Canada. As we live and work in the context of and in response to a colonial system of laws and policies, we feel it's important to acknowledge the historical and ongoing impact of agriculture and land enclosure on Indigenous land and food systems. So in this context, we acknowledge our collective responsibility um, to uh, work towards a narrative of reconciliation that places ecology, land stewardship, and Indigenous land title and rights at the forefront if we are to sustain the Earth's ecosystems in today's rapidly changing climate. Um, our deepest hope is that the future of our food systems is diverse, interconnected, and resilient embraces people of all walks of life and sustains the water, plants and creatures in ways that benefit and work side alongside Indigenous peoples and, and ways of knowing and caring for the land. So we encourage everyone to build relationships with the land and communities that surround the place um, where you are. Um, so I'm co-presenting with Dana Penrice today. So Dana, I'll let you, you introduce yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Dana Penrice. I'm the Prairies Program Manager for Young Agrarians. And I live on Treaty 2 territory, which is near, and I'm near Shoal Lake, Manitoba. And my partner and I moved here two years ago and we moved back to his family farm. So we're working on a family transition process here. And we run a mixed farm with um, cattle and grain and we're working on just under 1900 acres. We're also transitioning to regenerative agriculture. Back to you, Darcy. Thanks so much, Dana. So everyone who's joined us today, feel free to type where you're from into the chat window. Uh, and if you know the First Nations territory uh, you're living in, please feel free to include that. We always love to see where everyone is joining from. Um, so before we dive in today, just a little disclaimer, Dana and I are not lawyers. Um, throughout this webinar, we'll be sharing lots of information about transition, um, and our role uh, at Young Agrarians is as facilitators. So we're here to share ideas, frameworks, and considerations, but none of what we, we share is meant to be legal advice. And we, we always strongly recommend consulting your own lawyer or other professionals uh, before going down any particular pathway. And I'm probably gonna mention that a few more times throughout because the support of professionals in transition, as we all know, is really important. Um, okay, let's dive in. Um, for those of you who um, are new to Young Agrarians, um, YA, or Young Agrarians, is an educational resource network for new and young farmers in Canada. We started in 2012, um, and we um, do lots of different things. Um, in the land access space, uh, we um, offer land access guides, We've got online land and farmer looking for land listings on our UMAP. We do land linking workshops and transition cafes. In BC, we offer uh, the BC land matching program. And we developed last year 
uh, in BC a transition toolkit for non-family farm transfer, which is an online and PDF resource that we'll be uh, taking you through a little bit, introducing you to today. Uh, while it is uh, developed for BC with BC specific case stories, lots of the content um, is broadly applicable uh, to non-family transition across the country. So lots to learn there. Um, and why is the largest new farmer network in Canada? So we've got uh, programs as well that support business development, a business mentorship network, an apprenticeship program in the prairies, an online business boot camp, and plenty of networking and educational events across Canada. Um, so in the future, we hope to get to hang with more of you at events like that. Um, I just wanted to give a quick thank you to the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia for funding the Transition Toolkit. Um, thank you so much, Heather, for dropping that link in there, um, as well as to the Alberta Real Estate Foundation and the province of BC, as well as our regional funders for supporting all of our land access work across the province of BC and Alberta. Um, so just a quick uh, outline of where we'll take you today. So we're going to start with an intro to non-family transition and then um, I will introduce you to the transition stages that we outline in the toolkit. Um, we'll look at setting a vision, communication and relationships. Um, we'll explore different models for non-family farm transition as well as some case stories to illustrate those models talk about building a transition team um, and uh, wrap up with a little mention of exit strategies for those just in case moments and then talk about some next steps you might take. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dana now. I think it's important here to start with um, why we need non family farm transition. So it kind of, for me, goes back uh, quite a few years and, and seeing with, um, with some of the older farmers that I talk to, you know, they talk about the 80s being really, really hard. And um, since then, we've really seen narrowing margins in, uh, in farm businesses. And I think that the reality is, is that many current farmers have told their children not to return to the family farm, or perhaps the children have seen how hard their families have been working and have chosen not to come to, back to the family farm. So what we see is that there's a lot of current farmers out there who don't have successors. However, at the same time, we're seeing a growing interest um, in agriculture and food production from first generation farmers. And in a survey we were part of with the National Farmers Union in 2015, we surveyed um, new farmers across Canada and 68% of them, of them didn't grow up on a family farm. So, you know, we have this generation who needs successors and uh, a generation who is looking for farmland. So uh, there's work there to do in terms of farm, farm, family farm trans or non-family farm transition. Um, so once upon a time, non-family farm transition really just meant selling the land. But with the cost of what land is uh, now, um, it's, it's not always an option for the entering generation to just buy the farm. And so we're really exploring creative solutions to keep farmers on farmland. And we'll share some of those examples with you today. So what is farm transition? Um, it's the ongoing process of transferring knowledge, skills, labor, management, control, and ownership of the farm business to the next generation. And farm transition can include the land and the farm business or one or the other or both. And the goal of um, transition planning is really to uh, just navigate um, through this change. Thanks, Dana. Um, so uh, how do we navigate through this change? Um, the BC, the transition toolkit outlines a six stage process uh, to walk through all of the important uh, elements of a transition. Um, so uh, I'm going to share highlights of those now and then we'll, we'll walk you through them um, through the rest of this session. So first it starts with setting your vision. This is the heart of a transition. What do you want to achieve? Um, and then we start to look at how you get there and that's in stage two where you assess feasibility, um, what model is going to be the right fit um, and is that model possible and then Stage three, looking at actually turning uh, the vision and the chosen pathway into an action plan. 
Um, stage four, pulling together all the documents. Um, stage five, um, actually making it happen, implementing the transition plan. Um, and then stage six, maintaining, um, which gives you the opportunity to check in and adjust. And I just want to highlight that this is definitely not a linear process um, and um, might look um, more like a circle or a series of loops, a lot of overlapping um, moments. So while we've outlined this nice streamlined uh, six step process, uh, keep in mind that real life is always a little bit messier than we might like it to be. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Dana now to walk us through stage one. So thanks, Darcy. Um, stage one is all about visioning. So this is where uh, you really need to sit down and think through what do you want, what do you need, and what are your goals? So no matter what kind of, kind of land access model or uh, transition model you're looking at, it's important still to sit down and think through to have that clear vision of what you want for the land and the farm business. Um, it's important here to make sure that it's specific. So something like um, we just want to see that the farm, the, the land is farmed is a kind of a great high level vision, but it isn't quite specific enough. Um, your vision should really include thinking through some of the elements like the, like the land, but also the lifestyle. Um, that you want. Do you want to keep living on the farm or um, would you want to move somewhere else? Think through the finances. What will you need for your retirement? Um, things like environmental stewardship, uh, affordability, culture, legacy, and community impact. And the other thing to think about is how do these things all fit together? So maybe you want to make it easy for somebody to purchase your land, but you need to prioritize um, uh, your retirement income. And so sometimes there's some tensions between them that you need to kind of sort out in your vision. Um, some other other conversations that we're having with um, uh, current farmers in Young Agrarians is, are really around what their needs are. So um, of course, one of their needs is wealth management and retirement. So um, this might be something like, are you depending on selling the land for retirement income? Um, or do you have other retirement income streams that um, might play into this? You'd also, um, uh, one of the needs is to figure out the uh, estate planning and family legacy. So do you have children who might want not, you know, not want to farm, but should be considered in, in the farm transition planning? or maybe they don't know if they want to farm yet and you need to think through how they might be able to enter the business someday. Um, also, the needs of the current farmers is that they um, often want to focus on their farming legacy. So thinking through, you know, we've worked so hard to build this farm up and how do we continue it? How do we see it uh, keep going and really pass that on to the next generation? There's also um, sometimes an element of uh, preservation of farmland or conservation goals that are part of it. And then there's some, um, from that, there's just some key questions that you can work through. You know, what do I want my retirement to look like? What do I want my relationship for the farm to be? And um, this is just a short list of questions here, but there's more questions like this in the toolkit, which you can uh, go and check out. I think the link is now up in the chat. We also um, have lots of conversations with entering farmers about their needs. And so uh, just like the current farmers, they have needs around wealth management and retirement as well. Um, so it's important to think through that um, as part of uh, uh, that visioning process. Um, there's also, we hear from them that there's a need for um, either uh, personal and business security or flexibility. It's kind of a spectrum here that we hear. So some entering farmers are looking for that security and a long-term commitment, while other farmers are a little uh, bit more okay with some flexibility. For example, they might be willing to do a shorter term lease um, where others are looking to do a long-term lease. Um, uh, the needs of entering farmers, there's also some elements around financial capacity. So uh, entering farmers come with different financial capacity, but you know, this is thinking through, okay, what does the farm 
uh, need to earn for that second generation uh, coming in or you know what um, resources financial resources can they rely on to bring to the farm um, yeah and again just some key questions for that entering generation to ask themselves is what are my current financial resources and needs uh, how much money do I need in retirement um, even as the younger or entering farmers it's important to think through that and think through what you're working towards where do you want to live now and where do you want to retire to and how you know capital heavy is the business model that you um, want to be implementing um the next uh, big question that usually comes with um transition planning is will the entering farmers actually own the land um, and many come with a goal of owning the land and most of that is wrapped around having that security for the farm and for the business and uh, it's important to kind of uh, think through this um, because it's also a wealth management strategy for the retirement retiring generation and it's important to kind of challenge this idea because there's other ways that that um, financial that security and the financial needs needs can actually be met so one example is um, you can do a long-term registered lease which gives uh, security but that can and that can also be leveraged for uh, financing for that entering generation um, but maybe there's an there's other ways to do it with RSPs or other ways of building up that equity besides owning the land and in in agriculture 50% um, of, of farmers under the age of 35 um, uh, or sorry yeah 50% of farmers under the age of 35 will lease uh, land um, and overall 35% of farmers do lease land so it is something that is um, you know, very frequently used in the agriculture sector. Um, you know, the other way to think about this is if you were starting a restaurant, you wouldn't first step into buying the building, um, but you would lease it first. So for most entrepreneurs today, especially in those first few years, uh, they lease their premise instead of uh, owning it. So once you've kind of got your vision in place, it's uh, time to start thinking about um, those, what the possibilities are and starting to dream up who the perfect new farmer is uh, to come to your farm. Um, there's no need to kind of get caught up on the details of this, but uh, it's important to kind of think through um, who would be somebody that fits your vision and what qualities would that successor have? Some of those qualities might be, you know, you want at least a few years of farming experience. You want somebody with really good communication skills and the, abil the ability to work through problems. You'd probably want somebody with a shared philosophy, values and stewardship practice. Maybe you need somebody to come with financial resources. Uh, these are all things to, to think through in, in, in starting to look for your successor. The other thing to think through is what value proposition do you offer? offer and also what value proposition can the entering farmer offer to you um, some of the places that you can look at for um, finding a successor um, you might just look at your current uh, potential team that's on your farm maybe um, you have employees on your farm who are looking for that opportunity uh, to step into more of a leadership ownership type position um, young Agrarians has a very uh, big network of uh, young farmers who are potentially looking for land. So we've got ways to uh, promote your opportunity to them. Um, there's also, if you're in BC, you can uh, engage with the BC land matching program. And, and um, we have land matchers out there who will work with you through a lot of this and uh, to help you find a successor and work through some of those agreements. Um, and then there's also land linking um, uh, platforms that list profiles of both landowners and land seekers. And then um, the other big one to do is engage with community and events. So getting out there, going to the um, different farm meetings and actually just putting it out there that uh, you're looking for somebody and, and sharing with others what the opportunity is. So really using your network. Um, the next piece is around uh, building a common vision. So once you've found that person, it's important to start to explore the visions together. So 
Um, usually how I've seen that done is like each party kind of works on their own vision and then comes together for a meeting and starts to explore and share um, their ideas at the table. Um, so this is really the kind of foundation of um, the, the uh, relationship and arrangement. So it's really important to take time to do this, to really share those hopes and dreams and concerns and expectations and assumptions. And it, you know, it it's, can be difficult, but it's really a space where there's a lot of honesty that's needed and sometimes vulnerability to really share, um, you know, I'm worried about this piece of things. Um, and just get that on the table so that it can be part of the conversation going forward. It really helps you to figure out whether you are aligned um, with the people coming to work with you and what needs to have more uh, of a conversation. And I think while this can really feel daunting, um, it's really also a space where you can have a lot of fun and creativity with it to, you know, gather around the table with a really nice meal um, and uh, start the process off in a really fun and enjoyable kind of way. Yeah, and I just have one thing I wanted to add here, which is yeah. uh, when we were developing the toolkit, we uh, we talked to tons of uh, seasoned farmers about what they thought the difference was between family transition and non-family transition. And almost universally, everyone said, oh, non-family transition is easier because you don't have all of that family stuff that you have to deal with, decades of of relationship uh, stuff that might have built up. And that is true, that can be a positive, but it also means you don't have already a shared understanding of the value system. So a lot of what Dana is talking about here is taking the time to build that shared value system and that understanding that um, is more inherent in a family uh, transition. So that brings us to uh, communication, which is always the big one, both in family and non-family transition. Um, you know, I really, I really like this way of thinking about communication as a business risk management strategy. Um, you know, it really gets to kind of the why you would spend time on communication um, because it's that communication that is actually going to be able to build um, that shared understanding and build towards the success of your business and your future. So what we've seen that's really successful in farm transition is, is establishing that structure around conversations. So having um, uh, meetings, scheduled meetings with agendas and meeting notes. Um, we do that on our farm and it's amazing how you don't remember what was said at the last meeting. So having those notes really helps to go back and look at, okay, we actually already talked about this. Um, and I, I would add too in here that it's important to also think about communication that's not structured. So think about, you know, sometimes it's hard for people to have those big conversations at the uh, dinner table. Um, and, so, you know, sometimes there's conversations that are just easier to have when you're out in the uh, truck together checking the cows or whatever, sometimes those bigger visioning things can come out that way, um, which is okay as well. Um, I think the big thing is to stay curious and to listen deeply with each other, to ask open-ended questions and, and, you know, not kind of uh, shut the conversation down, um, to clarify your assumptions. So what did you really mean here when you said this? And to um, seek common ground, you know, what, what do we both value here? And to really kind of stay committed to it and um, stay persistent about it. I, you know, I think one thing I noticed with my experience in transition is that it can often feel, especially if you had a challenging conversation where there wasn't an agreement and it didn't end in agreement, um, you can often walk away feeling like, oh, like that's, it's done here or that's not, this is just isn't going to work. But these communication really is something that evolves over time and it's kind of the culmination of a bunch of conversations that happen over time. So, you know, just because something was said one time doesn't mean you can't come back to it and work through it again. So that's where it's really important to, to stay committed to um, keeping the conversation going. Yeah, and that's another difference um, with family transition versus non-family transition is that um, it feels easier to walk away when it's not family. And so in a lot of ways, it actually requires more commitment um, to sticking with the process and 
uh, not just uh, seeing that things are getting hard and washing your hands of it and moving on, um, because when you do navigate this tough stuff, um, it can be really rewarding on the other side. So um, you've got your visions, uh, you found each other and built a common vision, had some tough conversations and some joyful conversations, hopefully about what you want to achieve. Um, and uh, with a strong vision, now it's time to move into actually identifying solutions. So stage two, assessing feasibility, is all about figuring out how much of the common vision is achievable based on the financial capacity and the uh, needs of each party. Um, and then like, so looking at which model will provide the best framework for that vision. So the three that we'll explore today are owning land privately, um, cooperatives and community land trusts. And um, the, first, the first model, private ownership, um, you know, as Dana mentioned earlier, um, with the high cost of land today, um, purchasing a farm and the land often isn't a viable solution. Um, so when it isn't a viable solution, um, but land ownership is still a goal uh, and um, important for the needs of the, the retiring farmer, the current farmer. Um, creative financing uh, can be an option. It is possible. <laughs> um, I think uh, we all come into the idea of land ownership with really firm ideas about what a classic mortgage with a bank looks like. Um, but with support, um, it is possible to figure out alternatives that will meet everyone's needs. Um, and we've uh, highlighted a few here. Um, one of those is selling the land at below market value. So this might be in a situation where the uh, landholder, uh, landowner, current farmer doesn't need um, a huge financial uh, return from selling the land. And the other pieces of the vision, having the farm continue, uh, are more important to them than the financial piece. Um, and uh, I think the, the key here is that can really enable a, a new farmer to purchase the land, but there will be tax considerations. Um, in this case, a sale below market value must be reported as a, and taxed as a sale at market value. So this is a really important moment where an accountant is going to be so important to making sure that um, there aren't unforeseen consequences to, to the sale. Um, another option is looking at private lending for the mortgage. And um, there are two options here. One might be a vendor take back mortgage, um, which is a type of mortgage in which the seller lends funds to the buyer to help facilitate the purchase. Um, and then the seller is essentially a, a mortgage holder and gets paid back uh, over time with interest. That can make the upfront cost more manageable and flexible for an entering farmer. Um, and can address situations where the entering farmer could afford to pay the monthly mortgage, but may not be seen as qualifying for a traditional mortgage with, with a, a lender. Uh, the other option in private lending is uh, for the entering farmer to seek uh, outside private investors or fundraise in the community to purchase the land. Um, there's also co-ownership, which is where uh, more than one entering farmers uh, pool their resources together to buy land uh, from the current farmer um, and transition onto the farm. Um, this uh, can address the, the barrier that uh, alone one farmer couldn't afford the cost of land, uh, but it does require a ton of clarity and communication between the entering farmers who will be now in a, a long-term relationship essentially as co-owners of a property. Um, we have a case story here of Claremont Ranch Organics, um, an orchard in the Okanagan who um, decided that they wanted to transition the farm to someone outside the family because none of the kids wanted to take over the business. Um, and uh, they ended up finding a young couple who were really interested in a potential transition. They worked together over a number of years uh, to build a relationship and um, figure out what the transition plan would look like. So that setting a vision stage was, was really long, as was the assessed feasibility stage. 
Um, so they, uh, at various points in time, Matt and Molly, that the new farmers um, worked on the farm, leased part of the farm, lived there as well. They had um, a lot of different ways of testing the relationship and they ended up figuring out that a vendor take back mortgage was the right fit for them. Uh, partly this was because the landowners needed to sell at market value so they could afford to purchase a home to retire in. And the new farmers did have the capacity um, and they qualified with Farm Credit Canada for half the mortgage that they would need. Um, in order to fill that gap, the, the outgoing farmers actually did a private mortgage, vendor take back mortgage for the other half so that they could pull together all of the financing to purchase the land. Um, and uh, it worked out great in the end as the, um, the new farmers actually paid back the, the vendor take back mortgage ahead of schedule. Um, and they really found that having a lot of that trust and that relationship was so important to this because it's a huge risk to take to lend someone hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to purchase your land. Um, and the, the current farmers um, had both the confidence in the financial viability of the orchard as well as in the new farmers. Um, and uh, Bob, the, the current farmer, the original orchardist, really stressed that it took a lot of dedication and perseverance on his part to go this route um, because he did have initially some of the professionals advising him that this wasn't the way to go. It was a really bad idea, but he had a lot of confidence in his vision and in his plan. So um, he really stuck with it and um, they've made a successful transition happen. You can check out the full story here in the toolkit to see how uh, get more of the nitty gritty insights into how they navigated it. Uh, the second model we're looking at today is cooperatives. Um, there was a great session this morning on um, transitioning to co-ops. If you didn't check that out, I highly recommend uh, looking at the recording. Um, but essentially a co-op is just a type of structure that is member owned and democratically managed. Um, and a co-op could own the land or uh, farm the land and own the farm business or both. Um, it allows for pooling of resources, both in terms of labor and finances. Uh, it does require a high commitment to communication and interpersonal relationships because there's shared decision making. Um, and there are two ways that co-ops can factor into transition planning. The first is that um, an existing farm can become a co-op. So in this case, uh, the current farmers would decide we want to uh, turn our farm into co-op as a transition and they would recruit co-op members and navigate the path of developing the farm into a co-op. The second is that perhaps the current farmers don't want to be involved anymore, but a group of new farmers entering farmers, uh, the, the younger generation, let's say, could form a co-op and buy the farm business or the land or both and uh, turn the farm into a co-op that way. Um, as a case story here, we've got Horse Lake uh, Farm Co-op, which is in the Caribou of BC. Um, it's a 133 acre farm and uh, there was a group of farmers that had a long term lease on the land. So they've been farming for a while on that property and then the owner needed to sell um, both the owner who wasn't farming and the farmers who were leasing the land shared the objective of protecting the, the agricultural land um, and ensuring it could stay in farming and also keeping those farmers on the land. So they ended up um, turning the, uh, the farm uh, enterprise into a co-op um, so that they could sell shares to fundraise for buying the land. They ended up raising enough money that way to cover half the cost of the land. And then they found um, a co-op member who actually gave them a generous interest-free loan. Um, and they have been operating as a co-op on the land for uh, the last um, 15 years or so and are now looking at transitioning new farmers in. Uh, co-ops have a really nice like long-term transition model kind of built into the structure. Um, and what they found was really important for this transition was having lots of community support. They'd always been very active in relationship building in their community with their neighbors and that's what allowed them to fundraise and has allowed them to on an ongoing basis have lots of um, input both in terms of volunteer work and fundraising and a, a built-in market for their products and it's really been integral to their success. 
Uh, the third model that we'll look at is land trusts or community ownership of land. So a land trust is a legal arrangement um, that can hold land um, on behalf uh, or for the benefit of a third party, um, in this case, perhaps the community or a farmer. Um, putting land into trust is uh, one way to ensure that it um, will be used for farming in the future and can be accessible to new farmers. Um, you can create a trust to hold a specific property or you can find an existing trust uh, to, to uh, put a property into. Um, and land can be donated or sold to a trust, um, which is good to note uh, depending on the, the current farmer's financial needs, a trust doesn't necessarily mean the land has to be given to the trust. Um, there are tax advantages for charitable trusts, both for the trust and for landholders. Um, and I think really important to note about trusts is that they're easy to set up, they're really complex to manage, so it's important to work with professionals there and to have a long-term plan for sustaining the trust. Um, and Dana's going to share a case story uh, here as well. Um, this is uh, Hélène um, Tremblay Boyko and Al Boyko at Breadroot Farm. And uh, they have 1,400 acres at Knorr, Saskatchewan. And they have a certified organic beef, forage, and grain operation. And when Ellen and Al started this, they really, you know, valued keeping people on the land. And um, with, when they were watching kind of land prices grow crazy, they really wanted to find a way that they could support a young family to have the opportunity that they've had on the land without having that financial burden of land ownership. Um, so they really also didn't want to see their land become uh, a commodity. And the way they expressed it is that they really wanted to share it. Um, they began looking for somebody um, over 10 years ago and worked with a few different couples in that time that didn't work out. But eventually they found um, Stacy and Dale Meyer on farmlink.net. So Stacy and Dale were living on an acreage in Alberta. And at that time, Stacy had a goat herd and she was looking for land. And so she, she was on farmlink.net. Um, and she had seen Breadroot Farm on, posting on there, but she never thought of um, moving to Saskatchewan, so she didn't pursue it. Um, but Ellen actually pursued it and reached out to them and started uh, the conversation. And after a few years and a few visits, um, in 2018, they um, moved out to the farm. Uh, Al and Ellen had bought an acreage that was adjacent to their farms in hopes that the new farmers would uh, live there. So Stacy and Dale bought that when they came to the farm. The rest of the land is still owned by Al and Ellen, um, and it will be put into an existing land trust, the Farmland Legacy Land Trust, upon um, their death. And Stacy and Dale will have a lifetime lease to that land at that point. Um, on the asset side, I think a really important part of this case study is thinking through the assets of the farm as well, um, because it's not just the land that needs to be transitioned, it's, the, it's um, those other things, equipment and animals and things like that um, too. Um, so on the asset side, they've been slowly working on a transition and have a five-year plan. Um, Stacy and Dale are slowly acquiring ownership of the cattle herd. There's a hundred cows and they're in year three of the transition. So they own six cows right now outright, um, but then they lease and manage the rest of the herd. They have a one-third, two-third um, arrangement with Al and Ellen where um, they're paid one-third as um, part of the lease and then Stacy and Dale earn uh, two-thirds of the income from the cattle um, for their management of it. Um, Stacy and Dale have also taken over the hay operation um, and in the coming years they're going to learn how to manage the cropping enterprises. Their arrangement involves a lot of mentor mentorship from Al and Ellen um, and they've planned that out over those five years. Um, but Stacy and Dale are currently running the day to day and Al and Ellen um, participate in the farm by providing advice and also helping on those days when there's uh, more hands needed on deck. Um, they have uh, set up annual meetings um, where they review the plan every year. They have 
really good uh, regular communication. The other thing that they did um, that they talked about uh, really added to this was they all took holistic management together. Um, so it's a framework around business planning and decision making on the farm. And they use that framework um, kind of as common language to really help them set their visions. They use it to do their financial planning and their production planning. And their advice to other farmers in this kind of situation is to really start early uh, to look for your successors and um, be patient through the whole process. Back to you, Darcy. Thanks, Dana. Oh, um, sorry. So, <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's a lot of the what. We know uh, what you want to do and you've figured out if, if what you want to do is achievable. So now um, let's look at the how, moving into stage three, um, where you're exploring what structures will allow you to achieve your vision. Um, and that might be relationship structures, legal agreements, uh, financial supports. Um, this is all about identifying the solutions and then costing them out. And the goal is for everyone to understand what is needed to uh, facilitate the transition. Um, and, uh, this is a list of what some of those solutions might be. I won't get in depth into each of these, but just to highlight that um, they can be uh, deployed in different ways depending on the needs of a transition. So leasing, for example, might be a short-term solution that's used um, in the lead up to transitioning the land and farm business to allow the entering farmers to have some independence, uh, to add um, a, a new operation to the land, pulling in diversification there to, to generate more income. Uh, or it might be the long-term permanent solution, um, as in the case of perhaps a land trust where the entering farmer might lease the land from the land trust um, for as long as they're there. Um, employment, uh, both as a way of cultivating um, successors and um, as a, a longer term um, mechanism uh, can be a good solution. Um, in one farm uh, on the west coast here where the current farmers uh, couple have been operating a, a diversified farm for 20 years, uh, they have three children as well as a long-term employee who are all going to be integral to the transition plan and will take over the farm as a team. So this is a bit of a hybrid family, non-family transition. Um, each of them has different skills and the, the current farmers hope that their, their complementary roles in the farm will allow the business to thrive in the future and not put the weight on any uh, one person. Um, and they're currently mentoring the four successors, building up both the production skills as well as financial and business management proficiency. Um, they're still in early stages, uh, but they've got this solid vision and are putting their plans into motion. Um, what's important to know here is that um, this long-term employee, because they're such a valued part of the team, um, the, uh, the long-term employee will eventually be a partner in the farm business with the three children of the current farmers but the three children will inherit the land and that employee, eventually partner, will not inherit the land. So this is a case where just the farm business is involved in the non-family transition. Uh, and the farm business will lease the land from the current farmers and eventually the three children in a secure long-term agreement. Uh, so one of the things that the current farmers really wanted to address here is that um, without land ownership, the long-term employee is not gaining any equity from this transition. So they sought an alternative, they set up an RRSP and dumped in an initial lump sum contribution and they'll be making ongoing matching contributions. Um, so they felt that this was um, a good way to allow that, uh, that employee to build up a nest egg in other ways and feel like a true partner in the business. Um, incorporation, I'm going to share a case story where incorporation came into play next. Um, if you're going the incorporation route, definitely important to involve an accountant. Um, because uh, this adds a lot of complexity in terms of taxes and management, um, but it can also be a great solution to allow for the um, transfer of the farm business or even of the land. Um, just to touch on sweat equity on this list, 
And this is where unpaid labor is traded for an ownership stake in the land or the farm business. Very complicated and really important to ensure that everyone has clarity around both the expectations of this exchange as well as the uh, future financial uh, viability of the business and uh, how that unpaid labor plays into that. Um, life estate uh, is an option for um, farmers who want to stay living on their land while transitioning the land and farm business um, and where they can live on the land uh, for the rest of their lives. Um, and then insurance uh, is also worth mentioning how this can play into a transition, non-family transition. Um, insurance could be life insurance or buy-sell insurance in the case of a corporation. Um, in the Claremont Ranch example I shared, um, they looked at insurance solutions for both uh, the current generation of farmers as well as the entering farmers and tried to figure out where insurance would be most suitably applied. And what they ended up doing is that Matt and Molly, the farmers who were coming into the business, ended up taking out life insurance on themselves so that in the event something happened to them, Bob and Sharon, the, the current farmers, would be protected given that they were lending them uh, a whole bunch of money. <laughs> um, so uh, another way that insurance could be used is if um, the uh, older generation, the, the retiring farmers have life insurance, they could use that to provide a family legacy to their children if the land is not going to be left to the children, which can be a nice way of, of making sure everybody uh, involved feels like they've been treated equitably. Uh, this is Cibla Farm in Machosan, BC, and it's an example of transition through incorporation. Um, Cibla Farm is, oh, was owned by Bob, who inherited the land from his parents. Um, and when he started looking at the transition, his son didn't want to take over the farm. Um, and he ended up transitioning the farm into a corporation. Um, because he really was hoping the farm would keep going uh, into the future. Um, and as he says, a corporation never dies. <laughs> um, so Bob still owns the land and the capital infrastructure and the farm corporation rents the land and the, and the infrastructure from Bob. So that provides him with a bit of retirement income. And eventually the goal is for the land and the infrastructure to be transitioned to the corporation in whatever way uh, will result in the least amount of taxes. And that's, I think, the key piece that they're still trying to figure out. Um, and there is a farm manager who was really involved in the development of this plan who essentially runs the farm um, and the corporation is governed by a board of directors. And um, so this is a really great example of how incorporation can work in a non-family transition scenario. It gives the farmer security in the business um, and it uh, allows for some of the transition of land and infrastructure in the future as well. Um, really key uh, to consider throughout. I know we've mentioned accountants and lawyers a couple times now, um, but they're integral to a transition plan. Um, working alongside the right team of people is fundamental to success. And if you're wanting to go down the non-family route, uh, it's a little bit less traditional. It might be harder to find professionals who are um, uh, going to be experienced in some of these more creative pathways or uh, willing to let you take the risks as well in some cases. Um, so it's great to identify those people early um, and uh, know that they'll all come into the transition process at different points. Um, but if you know who they are, you can ask them questions and then you can also include the potential costs in your business plan so that you know you'll be able to sustain the, the transition team when you need it. Um, you can find uh, professionals in your region um, through the YAU map um, and uh, like the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors, but also really recommend word of mouth. If uh, you know people who love their accountant or love their lawyer, um, that's a great way to find a good person to work with. Uh, so I'm going to pass it back over to Dana now to talk about all the paperwork. <laughs> Um, so there is, a pa there is paperwork involved in this. Um, so uh, the documenting your plans phase really uh, is all about 
um, developing the documentation that uh, outlines everything in stage three. So it's really just about getting everything down on paper. So this is going to involve drafting written agreements. Um, it'll involve getting into that business and estate planning, thinking through obtaining finances, you know, how are you going to implement that business plan. All of that gets put down on paper. Um, so this really requires hand, hand, hands on involvement from the transition team. I think it's important to include um, both the current farmers and the entering farmers. They might take on different pieces of it, but having that agreement between the two of them is really um, key. And then also including those professionals such as lawyers and accountants that, you know, whole team that Darcy just talked about to uh, support that documentation of the, pro of the plan. Some of the um, documents that um, you might think through or might be included, you might have some of these or all of these or just a few of them. Um, one is an asset transfer. Uh, so they, this was used in the um, uh, case study that I shared on Breadroot Farm. Um, they have uh, that five year plan is really an asset transfer plan that outlines, you know, how, how that, um, uh, the assets will be passed on to the um, over time. Um, you might have a management um, transfer that happens. One um, document that I've seen in the management area is a scope of work. So if somebody is going to be taking over management of a herd, say, they might develop a scope of work that outlines um, what they're responsible for and, um, and how they'll be compensated for that. Um, you'll probably uh, include an estate plan. So uh, thinking through that eventual transfer and assets and, you know, not just your farm, but your whole life. Um, there'll be a business plan. Um, so setting out uh, what the operations, HR, marketing, finance, um, and if there's any business entity, entity formation that's needed, like starting a new business structure or how that might continue. Um, a land use plan. So this would be really important, especially if there's like specific projects that um, are going to be happening on the farm or if there's um, conservation easements. Um, I actually found when we moved back to our family farm, I found just getting some maps out and, you know, I didn't know the landscape really well. So just, you know, having uh, a visual bird's eye view of like, oh, this is where we had the bulls all winter and this is where this happens um, was really helpful for me uh, just in getting oriented to uh, the farm as we came here. And then um, also having uh, that retirement plan. So more details on just what's um, the retiring uh, persons want to live, their um, anticipated income, healthcare costs, um, putting that all down on paper. And that's just some of the plans um, and documents that will come along with this process. Um, the next stage will be um, is actually implementing the plan. So, you know, we've got the vision, we've got uh, the plan, and now it's about really turning it all into reality. And so this is where the actual handover of farm management and tasks and decision making takes place. Um, it's about executing on those agreements. Um, and actually transferring the assets. And I think it's important to know about the implementation. And as Darcy said earlier in this process in general, is that it's, it isn't always this like linear kind of um, path. You know, some of these implementations um, can happen earlier or they might happen later. For example, in the uh, case study I shared, um, you know, they transferred the herd over earlier in their plan uh, then they transferred over um, their cropping uh, enterprise. So, you know, these things can happen and evolve kind of um, as they need to and as it kind of makes sense. Uh, and then the next piece with all of this is really kind of like the maintaining it. Um, so, you know, you have your plan and you implement it and it's not as if that's just done. <laughs> it um, needs to be monitored. You need um, to make sure uh, that there's ongoing conversations about if expectations are being met. Um, you might set up benchmarks or milestones um, around certain things that um, 
everybody's expecting to get done. And again, in the case study I shared, you know, there was these kind of annual meetings that took place about, okay, this is where we're at in the plan. How are things looking for, for the next year? Do we need to adjust anything? Um, and that really kind of helped to keep them going on their um, path and really kind of stick to that plan. So having those regular meetings to evaluate how things are going is also really important. I'll pass it back to Darcy to talk about meeting the unexpected. <laughs> Yes, thanks, Dana. Um, and, uh, you know, running a farm business is definitely not the hardest part of a transition plan. Um, and uh, it's just a truth that not every succession or transition will succeed and move forward. And that's okay. Uh, you know, not every opportunity uh, works out across the board. Uh, and I think what's important here is uh, to prepare for plan for the best and prepare for the worst so that um, in the eventuality that a transition doesn't move forward, um, everybody can leave that feeling like uh, they've been treated fairly and they're moving on to the next thing, hopefully with maybe a bit of disappointment, um, but not empty handed and not feeling resentful. Um, transitions often collapse uh, due to breakdowns in the relationship um, where um, people might feel on either side that um, respect, recognition, and appreciation are, are the primary catalysts. Um, and this is why we spent so much time on that communication and relationship building piece earlier because um, it is what makes or breaks transition, uh, whether it's family or non-family in a lot of cases. Um, sometimes it's a financial reality as well that's going to get in the way of a transition plan. And that's another, that's another reason it's important to prepare for uh, the unexpected um, so that both parties know what it would mean to them if the transition uh, ends and um, everybody understands how the time, money, and energy that they've put in uh, as an investment uh, will come back to them um, so that they're not leaving empty-handed. Um, for entering farmers, this might mean actually getting a financial investment back if they need to leave. Um, or for current farmers, um, it's understanding what, it, what it's going to be like to be left without a successor after potentially spending five years developing a transition with someone and then uh, not having that someone there anymore. That could be a really big setback. Um, so every transition plan should contain exit strategies. I'm going to just highlight a few of the considerations here. Uh, one of those might be notice, how much notice each person needs if the others going to back out, uh, acknowledging that it could take time to find a new successor or a new farm opportunity. And there might be some uh, considerations in how the business is run that will make it easier to exit at different times than others. Um, another piece is finances. So how are financial investments being handled? And would it even be possible for a farm business to pay out uh, one person if the transition ends and what would that look like uh, if people were going to um, cash out an investment uh, roles. So in the event that you're halfway through a transition plan, um, how have responsibilities been transitioned in the farm business and what's it going to look like to transition those roles back to the current farmer or perhaps to another successor. Um, also, I think it's worth considering um, timelines in terms of the transition plan itself. So what is the point of no return in a transition plan? Um, I like to think about this as setting up green light moments or key check-ins uh, where um, you connect to ensure that everyone is still on the same page uh, before signing legal documents, for example, invest or investing in capital infrastructure, uh, transitioning the land. These are really make or break moments where going backwards is going to get increasingly complex, both legally and financially. Um, and then another consideration is equity. How and when is equity being transitioned? Um, and what does that mean for the, the success of the transition um, in one transition relationship that ultimately didn't succeed? The current farmers um, were gradually transferring livestock to the entering farmers but no land had been transferred yet. Um, and 
um, things went south financially. So the land wasn't able to be transferred to the entering farmers. They had all these animals, but no land access. So they ended up having to sell the herd. And that was a, a disappointing um, result in the end. Uh, and perhaps some planning for exit strategies might have ended in a different, uh, a different result. Um, so I think that that just highlights how important it is to, as I said at the beginning of this slide, hope for the best and, and be prepared for the worst. Uh, Dana, I'm going to hand it over to you to share uh, perhaps a more uplifting example of a transition not moving forward. Sure. So um, this is Blake and Anne, Anne Paul. They're from Red Deer and they were working with a ranching couple um, and uh, just outside of Red Deer and they were living on the ranch. Um, so Blake had, um, their arrangement was set up where Blake was managing uh, the cattle herd that was owned by the um, landowners. And they also, um, Blake also was uh, building his own herd within that. So it was an arrangement where there was a scope of work for, laid out for Blake's management of the herd, but then they also leased some land from them. They also rented the house that was on the um, property that they lived in. And Anne also started a farm flower business um, on that property as well. And so she had a lease agreement with them too. So there was a lot of paperwork involved in all of this one. Um, and they really worked hard over the years to create these agreements. They had um, pretty good communication among all of them and uh, things were kind of rolling along. Um, Blake and Edge were looking for a longer term lease um, just to provide them with more security. They were having a family and, you know, just wanted to know that there was a long term commitment there. Um, but kind of as they were working through that piece, there was uh, a farm property that came up um, through Blake and Edge's network and they just couldn't pass up that opportunity. And so they ended up purchasing an, another farm. And it was kind of one of those life decisions where things just kind of took a change in direction. Um, so they were able to purchase that land and uh, ended up moving on to that land and moving their cattle there. Um, and so the agreement or the arrangements kind of fell apart. There wasn't um, a, you know, a big financial uh, piece that needed to be sorted through as Darcy was talking about, because most of the agreements were just kind of month to month or like our monthly payments. So, you know, everybody felt like they were compensated and and basically what they did was um, kind of planned a, a six month um, period where they would wrap things up on that farm and uh, start moving all of their things to the other farm. Um, the landowners were um, fortunate in that they've been engaging a number of farmers um, for a while so they also have um, a market gardener, uh, Mike Kozlowski with Steel Pony Farms, who has been leasing land there for a while. And so he ended up moving on to the property. And then they also work with another young farmer who does a, a pasture poultry business there too. So they're kind of still surrounded by young farmers and are still engaged in that network and have some promising leads, hopefully, for um, finding their, their next farmer to help with the cattle. Um, so that, you know, it, while it didn't work out with Blake and Ange, there's still work there to do. Um, but I think the other important piece with this one that I, I, I think is good to highlight is that um, Blake and Ange were really able to build up their business um, on that land base. And so when they went for financing to buy the farm that they ended up moving to, um, they could actually uh, show that those businesses were viable and it was part of them being able to access that kind of um, financing. So I think that's an important element as well. So, you know, we kind of think of uh, these things always, you know, falling apart in, in um, conflict or in financial losses or that kind of thing. But I think part of it is that there's also just other opportunities out there. And so they don't always have to be a negative thing that um, the arrangement doesn't work. So, um, that's kind of what we have to share with um, all of you today. Thank you so much for listening to us. And I hope you guys found um, something within that that was helpful for your situation or a new tidbit for you to go and research and look up. Um, I think uh, what we'd like to invite you to do is just to 
think through what are your next steps. So maybe after this call, you can just jot down on a piece of paper, you know, what information do you need to get started? Um, we know we, we have the business toolkit link there. Um, there's also on the Young Agrarians page, um, there's land access guides that can be really helpful. They've got lease templates in them. Um, there's the UMAP on there, which can help you find people. Um, there's lots of resources on there and lots of resources in other places as well um, to go and check out. Um, you can think through who else needs to be involved. You know, um, maybe there's like, uh, we held a session a while ago and, and the conversation was really ended up being around like, well, my kids aren't farming, but they still need to know what's involved in this farm transition. So I need to go out and have a conversation with my kids. Um, you know, think through what your timeline is and think through what other resources and support people you might need to make this um, transition successful. So, of course, you can reach out to Darcy or I and uh, we love talking about this stuff. So feel free to contact us, share uh, your situation and maybe we can point you towards some helpful resources. Um, and we love hearing about the opportunities and challenges. Uh, that are out there. And lastly, I think if you have any questions, um, feel free to type them in the chat. We're uh, able to stick around here for a while longer. We've got until um, half past the hour. So um, we're happy to take any questions that you guys have and, and uh, hear what you're thinking. Darcy, any final thought words from you or things you want to add? Um, yeah, and I would say, um, you know, we have a small enough group that um, if you had something particular that you wanted to unmute yourself and ask, um, feel free to do that if we're here for the next 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, we're happy to, to chat now. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So a couple that I have on my mind is... Um, First, around the communication piece, because it's so important to have uh, have that really um, going well in a transition. How can external support be engaged um, to to help people navigate uh, communication? Do you want me to answer that, Darcy? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So one of the things. Um, uh, you know, you, when you think of your team, your support team, you have your accountant and your uh, lawyer, but you can also include a mediator or a facilitator in that as well um, to support that communication. And sometimes it feels kind of weird to bring somebody like that in, but from people I know who have worked with them, they really value it. So in Blake and Angela's example, um, when, they when they moved to that ranch, they first engaged um, a holistic management consultant who came in basically as a facilitator and helped them through those visioning conversations, especially because you know, sometimes it's just so hard, you know, when we're on the farm, we're working kind of day to day and dealing with fires all over the place. It's hard for us to kind of stop and think like, okay, what are we actually doing here? What do we want this to look like in five years? So um, that's a really great, uh, it can be really um, money well worth spent uh, to engage somebody like that. Darcy, do you have any other ideas? Um, I yeah, I think I would just highlight that um, it doesn't have to be when things are going badly that you bring in a mediator or a third party facilitator. Um, I think having support uh, right from the get go can um, really help to um, set the right stage for things because uh, I mean, it, communication is important, but it's really hard and we don't all have training in how to have conversations and it seems silly to say we need training and how to talk to each other. But when we're dealing with these big complex questions, um, it can really be supportive the same way that we don't put um, well, sometimes we do put pressure on ourselves to do all the bookkeeping or accounting ourselves, but we engage professionals um in all sorts of different spheres um and i would say you know the claremont ranch vendor take back mortgage example they worked with a mediator at different stages um working with a counselor one-on-one -on -one for different people involved in a transition can also be really helpful so that um, someone has a chance to process things um, outside of the um, perhaps pressure cooker of the family meetings or the team meetings um, 
is, is a really a nice idea as well. Um, and I'm just seeing a question about whether we have a list of lawyers who understand co-op farming in BC or other specialists that we've mentioned. Um, I'm going to drop a link into the chat window, which includes um, it's a link to our UMAP with uh, the category for resources from our transition toolkit, which are mostly focused on Western Canada at the moment. Um, with respect to finding a lawyer who specifically understands co-ops, um, I think I, I would check the BC Co-ops Association um, and see if they have any direct referral. Um, because I think that co-ops are, are actually not that well understood and can be challenging um, to develop. So I know the BC Co-ops Association has lots of resources for helping people work through co-op development. Um, in BC specifically, the Ministry of Agriculture also has um, an agribusiness planning program that allows farms to receive um, some financial support to engage uh, business planning professionals and co-op developers are one of the categories that is allowed as well as transition planners. Um, so if uh, your province has funding available through the government to develop transition planning, I think it's really good idea to look for all of those um, financial resources to support a transition as well. Um, and um, our eco village, I'm guessing that's probably Brandy. So I can definitely follow up with you here in BC and, and we can set up a, a time to have a conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions um, coming to people's minds or, or things that you want to add, Dana? Um, we're just thinking through our own transition and what I've, I've learned, even though it's a family one. Um, yeah, I think the biggest thing is like, um, knowing how long it's going to take and, or that it's going to take longer than you think, you know, I, I think I, I came out to the farm thinking that we would, um, just dive right in, uh, and, uh, get this plan written down and get it implemented, but it's really, um, been a slower process which has been really good it's been a good chance for me to get to know the farm as the daughter-in-law um, and to uh, just kind of get oriented so I think it's okay to just you know one one really good um, a plan I kind of heard that we use here is like it's okay to come to the farm and just like do the status quo for a couple of years and we kind of call it like status quo plus <laughs> um, so uh, and then, you know, slowly start to get into it. So, yeah, just uh, be patient. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's something that comes up in family transitions where uh, the younger generation wants to make changes and that can be really hard for the older generation within a family. Um, and I think that that's magnified in non-family transitions in a lot of ways because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, without that shared um, set of family values and understanding of the way things are done, um, everything is going to be new about the other person and their ways of doing things. Um, so I think taking the time to get to know the land and the business and figure out how both parties can have a voice in a way that feels really um, recognized for them. Nobody's stepping on toes, but everybody has a chance to contribute. Um, that's uh, probably where most of the magic happens in transitions. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question here, Darcy, on maybe you know the answer. I don't. Are farm transition consulting costs considered farm business expenses that can be deducted in tax processing? I don't. I don't know the answer to this question, and I think this would be a great question to ask um, if in some of the financial sessions uh, today. Although I think we're at the end of the day, um, or to your own accountant who will know specific to. Um, to the farm business that you're in, whether or not these will be eligible expenses. So I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about um, farm tax law to, to say. Okay, well, um, if we don't have any more questions, um, I think, um, you know, we can hang out for a couple minutes more, but I'm sure people uh, will never mind when webinars end a little bit early. Um, so we'll stick around for a couple more minutes and see if anyone has further questions. And then we'll wrap things up. But please do reach out and chat with us. Um, 
I would say, uh, you know, Dana talked about timelines. It's never too soon. It's never too early, even if you just have maybe a slight idea that this might be something that you're wanting to explore, um, call and, and we can have a, a conversation about what that looks like and uh, where your curiosity lies and what some starting points might be to, to see what next steps um, you might choose. I'm gonna step in and say thank you so much to Dana and Darcy for being with us today. It was a great presentation. Uh, on behalf of Farm Management Canada, we're really happy to have you here. So uh, this uh, session has been recorded, so it'll be posted on our website um, at the, the one that's uh, been, been posted in, in the chat box there, um, which is farmtransitionguide.ca. Uh, so feel free to, to visit that and in a couple of days. It should be up by then. Uh, the, the toolkit, as you can see on the screen right now, is, uh, uh, is available by Young Agrarians. Feel free to go take a look at that. And you can connect with Darcy or Dana afterwards with the addresses that are there. Um, so thanks again to everybody. If you do have other questions, I think uh, Dana and Darcy said they'd stick around for a couple of minutes, but uh, we're going to leave it open. And uh, maybe we'll just shut off our videos, but we'll still be there for a little while. And if you want to take note down the information that's on the screen, feel free. Thanks very much once again. We'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Mm -hmm. um, we just have one more question come up about examples of crop share as a transition step. And that's a great question. Um, I'll, I'll share my thoughts and then perhaps pass it over to Dana. Um, I think crop share is, uh, definitely something that can be included in a transition plan, um, especially as part of a transition. Um, if you're trying to figure out how to divide labor and divide um, revenue income, it, it might be a really nice way of, of allowing for that. Um, and could be uh, a gradually implemented so that over time, um, the the percentages of the crop share shift to recognize the um, more responsibility being transitioned to the new generation or to the entering farmer. Dana, did you want to add anything there? Yeah, that's essentially what Elaine and Al Boyko did with their cattle herds. So the calves were basically a crop share where they got one third and the entering farmers got two third. Um, but the other reason I think crop shares can be really helpful, especially in like the first year is that the um you know i'm thinking of a like grain cropping um enterprise um is that sometimes the younger farmers can't get the lending to get um their inputs paid for so in this kind of scenario you might be able to set it up so that, that those inputs are still um you know the lending and banking can come from the um current generation but the new generation is still kind of benefiting from um, some revenue from the crop share as well. So it, and it kind of, once you get that going, it kind of gets things um, going so that you can take that to the, the lenders and, and uh, hopefully in the years after they can qualify more easily for those kinds of loans. There also might be uh, tax advantages to setting things up in a crop share. Um, and this is where an accountant would have a much better idea, but some of the federal programs um, uh, looking at who is considered a farmer um, in any farm business and, and how different benefits or tax exemptions or um, added taxes might come into play. Um, it's a really, really an important consideration. So working with an accountant will allow you to outline, you know, here are my concerns, here's what I need to achieve financially, and an accountant to say, here are the risks tax-wise, and here are the solutions that might fit to, um, to make this uh, the financially most advantageous setup for you. Mm -hmm. And I think, Les, I don't know where you're at, but um, on the prairies, I think there's quite a few, like if you just Google crop share agreements, like there's templates from uh, the provincial governments that um, can outline some of the things of how that actually works. Well, I mean, taxes seems like a really great place to leave things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so why don't we wrap things up there? And um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And um, please reach out to share your transition stories or your questions with us. And um, 
Otherwise, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.